Hello, I'm Krista Petley and I'm a Professor of History at the University of Southampton. I'm going to talk to you today about a really big topic, humanity and the cosmos, telling you the story of humanity and the cosmos from the beginning to the end. Now, like all stories, um, this has a purpose that I'll talk to you about in a moment. Um, and I'd like to begin it by asking you a question about stories and how they begin. Thinking back to when you were a child, how did all good stories begin? Hopefully, a number of you at least are sitting at home now muttering once upon a time. But this particular story that I'm going to tell you can't start like that. This story has to start a little bit more like once upon a before there was any time, there was nothing. And then nothing exploded. And then there's time and then there's everything. And it's at that point that our story can begin with the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. And what I'd like to do with you today is to talk to you about our place within the story of the universe that begins with that event 13.8 billion years ago. And the reason that I'd like to do that is to answer this question of can I get a bit of perspective? My whole purpose in presenting this talk to you is to put what we call history, the story of human beings, particularly the story of human beings in fairly recent centuries, and put all of that in the grandest possible perspective. This essentially is what historians do. One of the things that we are, um, that we do through our research and through our teaching is help us to understand who and what we are and to put ourselves and our problems into perspective. So there's our timeline, beginning with the Big Bang, coming all the way up to today. But before we get into any of that, I'd like to talk to you briefly about dragons. I live my life surrounded by dragons. I've got some here. I've got three small children and they are absolutely fascinated by dragons. And the main reason is the books that you can see there in front of you, Cressida Cowles, how to Train Your Dragon books. My kids are age five and, and eight, so they absolutely love these things. And the reason I mention it, I think, is because it helps to underline one of the points I've already made, which is that stories have a, have a purpose. All stories are doing some kind of work, even made up fictional stories, stories that you tell small kids. And so I'll illustrate that with Hiccup Horrendous Haddock III, who is the hero of these How to Train Your Dragon stories. Now they follow Hiccup trying to become a member of the hairy hooligan Viking tribe. And as he tries to do this, he encounters a number of problems. One of them is how to train his tiny little dragon Toothless, who is extremely disobedient. He has to do that to be initiated into the tribe. And because he's finding it hard, he goes and gets some advice from an elder of the tribe, his grandfather, a man called Old Wrinkly. And Old Wrinkly gives him some good advice. He says, that small dragon that's causing you all that bother, that's not a problem. A sea dragonus giganticus maximus. Now that would be a problem. And of course, the story tells of how Hiccup does encounter a sea dragonus giganticus maximus. And unlike the other Vikings who want to overcome this problem through brute strength and ignorance, Hiccup uses his brain, he uses cunning, and he uses teamwork to overcome this great big problem. So what Old Wrinkly gives to Hiccup and what I think these books give to the kids who listen to them beyond a lot of fun is a sense of perspective. Understand what are small problems and what are big problems, but also think about how you can overcome those, those problems. 
this is what I want to do with the talk today, is to give you a sense of perspective. And the story that I tell will try to do that. And I'm going to use this tool, a cosmic calendar. Now this is a way to give you a sense of perspective um, in terms of how we fit into the bigger story of the universe. So we've got the Big Bang at the beginning of January. So imagine the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago as the very first moment on the first day of January. And we are right at the very last moment of the 31st of December. So that's the cosmic calendar year. Uh, to begin with, there's physics, shortly after this chemistry. Biology, only in the autumn do we find biology. And biology, only in one particular part of the universe, on planet Earth, which has all of the so-called Goldilocks conditions necessary for life which is essentially what we mean by biology. Not too warm, not too cold. The mix of the Earth's chemical elements and its position in the solar system have allowed it to create and then to sustain life of different forms for more than three billion years, or since the autumn of the cosmic calendar year. But for most of that time, the life on Earth that existed would be fairly unrecognisable to us as, as life. We only start to get the kinds of life forms that we'd perhaps recognise as being life in December and fairly late on in the month of December as well. We start to see amphibians and reptiles and the sorts of plants and flowers that we would think of when we think of life on Earth. I want to talk about us as humans within the, the context of, of that life. And to do that, I need to talk to you a little bit, um, or at least one way of doing this is to talk to you a little bit about dinosaurs. The dinosaurs come about um, in the wake of one of the major extinction events in the Earth's history. So there have been five of these so far, and Possibly we're living now through a sixth. The end Permian mass extinction about 250 million years ago, or on our cosmic calendar year, around about Christmas Eve, that saw the extinction of about 90% of all of the species that lived on Earth as a result of massive volcanic eruptions that, that changed the climate. From out of the wreckage of the Permian extinction rose the dinosaurs. And dinosaurs, in one way or another, walked the Earth until the end Cretaceous mass extinction, the, the famous asteroid that we believe clattered into the Earth, creating uh, the conditions for the extinction of the dinosaurs. About 65 million years ago, or the 30th of December. Now... Just to illustrate some of these things, I'd like to introduce a couple of dinosaurs to you. It helps to have small kids when you're doing this particular talk. This is Mona. I don't know why she's called Mona. She is a brachiosaur. And here is Ice Cream, who is a T-Rex. Now, the question is, who would win in a fight between those two dinosaurs? It's a slightly cruel question because it's a trick question. The answer to it is that those two would never have actually encountered one another because they're separated by 85 million years of evolution. Uh, the Brachiosaur was around in the late Jurassic period, about 153 million years ago, and the Tyrannosaurus was around at the time of the late Cretaceous extinction. Um, so there's 85 million years between those two, and there's only 66 or 65 million years between us and the Tyrannosaur. So we're closer in time to the Tyrannosaur than the Tyrannosaur is to the Brachiosaur. It just gives you a sense of how brief a time has passed in cosmic calendar terms since the extinction of the dinosaurs. That extinction gives rise to a new geological era, the Cenozoic, 
and the age of the mammals. The final day sees uh, mammals as being the predominant species on Earth. And the rise late on in that day of apes and eventually of humans. Now the human story, that occupies the evening of the last day on the cosmic calendar year. And the story of us, Homo sapiens, just the last eight minutes. So here's a little bit more about humans. You'll probably know that we as Homo sapiens are just one species amongst many different types of human. And we're very much latecomers. You can see in front of you some examples of these other species of human that existed before and in the case of Neanderthals overlapped with human beings. Homo sapiens, that is to say. And what you can see is that Homo sapiens have arrived very recently. And they've also been very successful in terms of their geographical reach. We've been around then. Modern humans, Homo sapiens, we think for about 200,000 years. Now, these are all estimations um, drawn from the archaeological record. And so we can never be sure and there is debate. But for our purposes today, uh, about 200,000 years is a, a reasonable estimate as to how long we as a species have been on Earth. And for half of that time, we have been living in Africa, where we first evolved. And only about, we think, around 100,000 years ago, did Homo sapiens leave Africa and begin to populate other parts of the world. Uh, a really important migration took place about 50,000 years ago when uh, human beings populated Australia, migrating for the first time across the sea. And about 20,000 years ago, human beings crossed from Asia into the Americas. And by that time, human beings then were in all different parts of the, of the world, had spread out, but still spread out quite thinly in terms of population. For all of that time, people were hunter-gatherers, spreading out, but fairly thinly. We don't really know because it's hard to make estimates, but we think probably about four million people across all of those four continents. Then, a major transformation that brings us towards the story that we're going to be telling for the rest of the talk about history. A major transformation that leads towards that takes place about 11,000 years ago, when human beings began to develop farming. And with that, settled down into settlements, the, the biggest of which become cities and then develop into empires. And this is interesting because it takes place in different parts of the world separately. So we know that people began to farm and settle in the Near East, but separately groups of people did this in parts of Africa and in parts of Central America and parts of Asia as well. In each case, it brings about some quite fundamental changes. The rise of cities leads to hierarchies, people who are in charge, lording it over the people who produce the food. Specialisation, settling down, means that not everybody has to be engaged in hunting or finding food, and so you can specialise. Armies to defend cities or to extend empires. These clusters of population are breeding grounds for for plague, and if crops fail, famine can be the result. Writing is also something that develops with cities, um, partly because it's important to be able to organise those cities. And so writing down, for example, who owes tax is important. So all of these transformations that lead to us to be able to study history, which depends upon the written record, take place quite late on in the story of Homo sapiens, only really in the last 11, 10,000 years. Other transformations that take place as a result of the development of agriculture and settlement is a growth in population. So we see a, a rise um, as a result of this agricultural revolution 
in global human population to about 175 million. So this, as I say, lays the foundations for the source material that we use as historians. The first writing dates from about five and a half thousand years ago. But of course, most of the, the, the history that we study is much more recent in the last 2000 or so years. That's the period that's uh, depicted there in the yellow box in the cosmic calendar in front of you. The last five seconds of the final day of the cosmic calendar year. And I want to just show you something that illustrates some of the dramatic changes that take place within that last five seconds of our cosmic calendar year. So this map, this map shows you population and population centres um, of, of a million. Now, the dots aren't cities. They show you, they give you a, a, an approximation of where population is clustered in that, in that region. So you'll see there are no dots, for example, in the British Isles, even though people were living there at this time. Um, they're represented by nearby dots. And remember, we start off in around this period with a global population of about 175 million. One of the interesting things about the map is just how much of global civilization is focused on the east, is, 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 is uh, located in the east, in India and in China. Those places have always been really, really important centers of human population, of civilization. And that's something that's worth remembering um, because when we look at the world today, it's easy to think about the rise of China or the rise of India. But in fact, what we're looking at in many ways is the re-rise of those places that always were incredibly important hubs, centers within the human story. We're starting to get up to events that people will recognize and around about now we have the Norman Conquest. You'll see some dots disappear with the Black Death in uh, Asia and Europe which is coming up fairly shortly. but it doesn't make a great deal of difference to global population and you'll you'll see some there are quite a few dots not not so many as elsewhere but in the Americas there are lots of dots there are dots there some of those will disappear from around about now because the arrival of Europeans in the Americas uh, brings old world diseases from these much denser clusters of population in the old world to the Americas, which leads to um, a huge amount of, uh, of illness and death in the Americas. But gradually you'll see dots there reappear as a result of natural increase and of migration. And then from about this period, with the development of modern agriculture, modern medicine and other transformations, an absolute explosion of global population. So that's gone through where we are now into a projection for 2050. Now let me show you that same story slightly differently. This is carrying on at a rate of a century a second. Global population from about 175 million up to its current position of seven and a half billion. a really rapid rise from around 1800 when we think there were about 900 million people to our present population. 
it fits into that orange box on the very right hand side of the last day of the cosmic calendar year. We're talking about transformations that in cosmic calendar terms take less than half a second. As a species, we've been around for a brief time in the context of the cosmos. About the last eight, eight minutes of the cosmic calendar year, 200,000 years in total um, for our species, and with a lot of transformation taking place incredibly recently within our, our story, really the last 200 years being especially dramatic. So what is it that makes us so special as a species, so dominant and so dangerous? Well, we haven't got time to talk about this in much detail. But some of the things that we should highlight are that humans have been able to use tools and successfully harness energy from the Earth's resources. From quite early on in our history, we harnessed fire. But then with the arrival of agriculture, harnessing the power of other, uh, other animals, including horses and cattle, and then much more recently, steam power, a hydrocarbon revolution and nuclear power. So those are some of the things that make us different to other animal species on Earth. What is it about us that allows us to do that? Well, there are lots of things. I mean, one, of course, is that we've got a very big and very complicated brain. That has to be an important part of, of what makes us so dominant and so dangerous. But on its own, a brain doesn't get the job done. You also need tools and humans come equipped with tools first evolved in order to help us to cling on to tree branches but that are incredibly useful also a multi-purpose this is like a swiss army knife of a tool that you've got on the end of your arms in your hands a multi-purpose tool that you can be put to good use once we're upright and walking on the savannah so this the first of our tools combined with our brain we can use to create other kinds of tools of increasing sophistication and apply them to different sorts of problems. So this is this is part of what helps to make sense of human domination, intelligence and dexterity. But there has to be, I think, a bit more to it than just that. If you've got animals at home, you might be at home watching this now, have a look and see what they're doing. And I can bet you that they're not doing something like this. They're not doing something like you can see in the picture there, the cats making some kind of plan. And they're not doing what you're doing, which is actually really quite weird in the context of um, the animal kingdom. Watching another animal, unknown to you, on a computer screen, telling you about stuff. That's a very strange thing to do um, for an animal. Most animals are, are quite cautious about uh, other members, even of their own species. This, this is, I think, the, one of the fundamental things to understand in terms of making sense of how it is that Homo sapiens in such a short period of time have done so much, have covered so much ground, literally, in terms of their migration, and also developed so much technologically and achieved this population boom that we saw. What is it that makes us special? Well, language is absolutely essential to that. The ability to communicate with one another, to learn from each other, collective learning, and to cooperate en masse. We can do what most animals can't do with these particular tools, the tools of language, collective learning, and mass cooperation. This is absolutely essential then to who and what we are and to making sense of why it is that now we live on a human planet. Language, spoken, but also written. And there are different types of writing, including print and what you're looking at now on the screen. So all of that, language, collective learning, mass cooperation, culture. This is the thing that makes humans so potent, so devastating and dangerous and successful. 
Which brings us back to stories. Stories are a really important part of what makes us human. And they're an important part of what makes humans successful, being able to communicate with each other. And story is really important on so many levels. We started off by talking about how kids learn about their place in the world through story. But you learn as well about history through people telling stories like the one that I'm telling you now. And even very technical information is packaged up in stories. Human beings crave story, they learn from story, and it's through telling stories that we communicate with each other. So much of what we do, in ways that perhaps aren't immediately obvious, is communicated through storytelling. So there, I hope, I've given you, through my story, a bit of perspective through the tool of the cosmic calendar year. 13.8 billion years, and there's you. And we've looked also at human beings across the globe and at fast increase, especially recently, of global human population, which means that you are one in 7.5 billion. There's you. Probably. You might be watching this from somewhere else. I'm making an assumption there. Um, but there's me anyway in Southampton. Now that can be a little bit scary, that kind of perspective. One way of thinking about what you've just heard me talk about is to feel a bit scared and very small. Now, that's a normal response, I think, but it's also something, again, to think about and put into perspective. You are one in 7.5 billion, living a human life that's going to be a very short blip in terms of the cosmic calendar year, but also extremely fortunate in so many ways. So many ways. If you think about the life expectancy of people who were hunter-gatherers, who came in generations before you, or even those early occupants of, of, of human cities, prey to, to famine and, and to plague. And although those things haven't gone away, we are able now, much better because of the understanding that we have of the world around us, to mitigate the, the problems of food shortage and disease. So we're actually extremely fortunate. And being able to learn collectively and use this kind of technology to do that and to live the kinds of lives that we generally can means that we're extremely fortunate. So I'd encourage you to be upbeat and optimistic about the stories of perspective that I've been giving you. I do want, before we finish, to return briefly to the dragons though. We're all going to encounter dragons in our lifetime big problems and small problems within our within our own life and the societies that we live in they're going to encounter dragons as well some of them very very big and we're living at the moment through a period of crisis created by the coronavirus outbreak um, certainly that classifies i think as a big problem that's facing the global community and we can number it amongst others I mean, for example, since the 1940s, we as a species have had the power to annihilate huge numbers of other human beings, and even end life on Earth itself through the development of nuclear weapons. We know now that we've developed the, the circumstances on Earth through the, the consequence of our industrial revolution and our hydrocarbon revolution to change the Earth's um, temperature and bring about extremely far-reaching ecological change. So the human planet is occupied by this species, us, with godlike powers to transform and even end life on Earth. And also some of the other things that we've developed as a species, for example, the ability to communicate with one another and to travel around the world and to live in these tight clusters um, in cities 
uh, helps to bring about the circumstances that allow viruses and bacteria to spread things like the coronavirus. So we're, we're, we're dealing here with some of the consequences of the way that we have developed as a species and the ways that, in which we've come to live on this human planet. So these are dragons, one way of thinking about them at least. Problems for us as human beings to, to confront and hopefully tame. Now, how are we going to do that? I'm not going to give you answers to that because, of course, I can't. And also because this is a very short lecture. But through collective learning, mass cooperation, culture, working together, can we somehow, do we think, find ways to prevent nuclear war? We've managed to do that for 75 or so years. Can we tame global warming? And can we tame and defeat the current global pandemic and, 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 um, and head off any potential future ones? These are real issues for us as, as a species. Whether or not we can come to terms with those sorts of problems will determine the end of our story. Will we live happily ever after? How can we survive happily? If we are to do that, it's going to be really important that we keep on learning, communicating and cooperating. And here I have to say there are grounds for pessimism if you look around the world. If you think about the ways in which human beings don't cooperate, don't get on, don't communicate and share information and understand one another. I don't need to even give you examples. You can just think of them. Those sorts of things, if you think about them, might lead to a pessimistic notion as to how long human beings will continue to live on the world and be its dominant species. We've been around for 200,000 years. Maybe we won't be able to sustain that into another 200,000 years. But I think we do need to be optimistic. There is plenty in human history to suggest that actually collective learning can be extremely effective, that human beings can come together in mass cooperation and overcome their problems. If we're going to do that, then the sorts of work that you do as historians, understanding the world, understanding how it came to be as it is, understanding yourselves and your societies within context, in other words, getting some perspective, all of that is going to be absolutely essential. Not just to understanding the past, but these are essential skills beyond that in terms of making sure that we as a collective are able to confront the problems that are in front of us. And in order to be able to make sense of all of these things, to get perspective, to understand the world in context, we need to communicate with each other. And that, of course, means stories, good stories, true stories. And that, I hope, will mean that we can have a much more optimistic view of the future of humanity in the cosmos. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.